Hello and welcome to News Click. Over the past few weeks, we have been talking a lot about Ukraine, about the war hysteria that is being built up, whether invasions are going, the supposed invasions that are going to take place every week. This week, we are going to shift a bit and talk about an issue that has also been in the news over the past few weeks, which is the amnesty report, which has declared that Israel has been practicing apartheid against the Palestinians. Now, this report has a lot of uh, important aspects to it, which need to be discussed. We'll be talking about all this on Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Prakash, sir. Prabir, so in, uh, this is a very interesting report, both because of what it says and the responses to it. We'll come to that, of course. Now, some of the key things of the report are, one, it's one of the first, it's not the first report of this kind. Palestinian organ activists have been saying this for decades, if not generations. And we do know that even some human rights organizations over the past few years have increasingly come to adopt the paradigm of apartheid while talking about what Israel is doing. But nonetheless, this report has sort of summarized the experiences of Palestinians from 1948 onwards, talking about those in the occupied territories, talking about Palestinians in Israel, Palestinians in the diaspora. So that way, it's a very comprehensive uh, report in some senses. But uh, taking maybe a larger picture, what do you see as some of the more you know, larger significances of this report coming out at this point of time specifically? I think the major importance of this report is amnesty, which till date had been quite wishy-washy on this whole issue of Palestinians and what the Zionist uh, racism is all about, settler colonialism, that it has shed a lot of that, not completely. We, we can discuss later what it hasn't or said, but it has addressed glaring issues, which if it doesn't, then it becomes, uh, at least can be targeted or identified as a group which really is partial to what maybe the Russians do, what maybe the Chinese do, but not what happens when it comes to a major Western favorite, which Israel is. So I think in that sense, it is also a credibility of amnesty at stake. If it doesn't raise these issues, only talks about third world or countries which they don't like. So I think this is where it is a very important report because it comes from essentially the heartland of the United States, the West, the Europeans and so on. They have been using amnesty for a long time to talk about various human rights violations that now this is also to be addressed regarding what has, what's happening in the West Bank and what's happening in Israel itself. And also, of course, Gaza, which remains a bleeding wound in, the, in that part of the world. So I think that is a very, very important landmark because it's happening within the heart of, shall I say, the Western liberal uh, thought about what human rights is. That's also the reason why it, uh, Israel is so worried about it, as it is also worried about United Nations, which also is now coming around to criticizing it on various counts, particularly with its, what, what its handling of Gaza is. I think these, in that sense, are therefore coming to a head for Israel, that slowly it is coming to be, be recognized what should be considered a state which should be outside the pale of civilized behavior, like apartheid South Africa was. And if it reaches that state, that that is how people view it, then slowly the legitimacy it pretends to have, particularly in Western media and within Western powers, that is slowly going to erode if it is not already eroding. So this is, I think, the bigger picture. As you have rightly said, it addresses issues which hitherto have not been so much focused on. Gaza has been there. That's something that people can't deny. But it has always been assumed that Palestinian citizens of what would be the historical Palestine, who are in Israel, they have full citizenship rights. This is the picture that's always been given to us. Now it seems that's not true. It's also not true that they can acquire land easily. It's not true that they can acquire buildings easily. They are, in fact, slowly being eased out of places where they used to be and slowly being also ghettoized, which we know. And uh, what from reports that we have, that 
for them to get land is almost impossible. 93% of thing, I think, of land in uh, Israel is vested with uh, the state in a way that only Jewish citizens can, act, can have ownership of land there. So they are restricted to about 7%, though they are 18% of the population. So if we leave all of that out, the daily, really the daily grind of this kind of exclusionary behavior that in order to go to school, you need to cross gates. Of course, that's much more the fate of the West Bank today. Gaza, I'll come to later. But in West Bank, going to school, going to hospital, going to your field, all of this needs going to check posts. And check posts are manned by 18 year, 19 year kids who are taught to hate right from the beginning. They are really non-citizens and we have to treat them as such. So the power is exercised and this relationship of apartheid as it is now being openly called is also through this kind of uh, system where you teach the young how to treat an occupied territory. And this is where it starts from. And that gets internalized when you enter the uh, Israeli military forces, which is they're supposed to mandatory. do uh, mandatory. And of course, colleges uh, later on. All of this starts with your duties on the check posts. And for the Palestinian citizens from childhood. It also starts at the check post. So this is one part of it which is very clear. The taking away land is an everyday occurrence. Settlements growing, everyday occurrence. And all of this is available. Treatment of Gaza, which is what the, were the original inhabitants of south, you know, the southern part of uh, what is now Israel. They have been really displaced made refugees and have been stuck into this little small ghetto of Gaza where they don't have access to sea, they don't have access to any other country for importing goods, they don't have access to agricultural land which has been taken over by the settlers in that part of, the, uh, of Israel. It was originally their land from where they have all been squeezed into Gaza. Right. And then Gaza is looked on as a case where Israel claims they have to periodically mow the grass. Except mowing of the grass means taking out active population who can resist them is becoming increasingly more and more difficult. So this is the bleeding wound at the heart of Israel, Gaza. And of course, the West Bank, which is not in the same state of, as Gaza is, it has a little more uh, resemblance of Palestinian authority in pockets, some amount of uh, funds coming in from outside. But Gaza has no viable way of sustaining. So if you look at that, it is a, essentially has been made completely dependent for, from food to any necessity, including water and electricity, on Israel. So this is the total dependency that's been built in. So this is the structural apartheid. Of course, the violence of the settler communities, violence of Israeli uh, forces, violence of Israeli uh, police, all of that is of the larger, uh, the part of the larger picture. But the structural regime of apartheid, where people have very different rights depending on which part you are from, as a Palestine, Palestinian in Israel, you have partial citizenship rights, not full, partial. If you're in West Bank, it's occupied territory, but you don't face the kind of brutality that Gaza faces. Gaza, of course, is the worst. And you have Jordan Valley next to the river. So it's really, in that sense, a part of the West Bank. And there, of course, they're not allowed. So you, you can see the way this whole squeezing of the Palestinian population is going on. And Israelis are very frank about it. They think that if we squeeze them enough, they will leave and this land will become totally ours. So that's, the, that's what they're looking for. And that's the argument they give. So designating them as an apartheid state is the fear that they lose legitimacy in the Western population. And it's the Western countries, particularly the United States, which really props up the state of Israel. And I think that the amnesty report, therefore, is a huge blow to their credibility and the credibility of the story that they are somehow oppressed 
by the Palestinians, by the Arabs, we don't know by who, but they are somehow oppressed. And therefore, the legitimacy of Israel is the legit legitimacy of the Jewish people having a homeland. The whole, uh, what shall we say, the settler colonial myth of Israel, that that is endangered. And if that is endangered, there is a huge risk that the isolation of Israel will continue to grow. And under such conditions, that it's a long-term viability of Israel. Younger people may leave. The long-term viability of Israel based on funds from the United States and others may slowly dry off. Then how does Israel survive? Lonely outpost of the Zionist state or as the outpost of the Western powers in that region, which is what it has been from the beginning. Right. Prabhupada, in this context, of course, some criticisms have also been raised against the amnesty report while they have gone, uh, they, they have moved, like you said, from their earlier position much ahead perhaps. But some aspects still missing from their larger understanding or conceptualization of Israel as a state and how it functions. So could you take us to some of these as well? Well, you know, the whole issue is the settler colonial state. The issue of the settler colonial state, which is what Israel is, that is not addressed in the amnesty report, is what has been uh, the criticism of it, that it really stems from what was started by Christ Christian Zionists at that time, a land without people and a people without land. So it's an ideal fit. The whole idea that this is empty land. Now, this is the central picture of settler colonialism, as you know, that effectively the entire uh, settlement in the Americas was because it was empty. We know that it wasn't. We know it was genocide. All that is known, but the so myth of settler colonialism or settler colonial states, whether it's the Americas or, the, or in Australia, has been that. So this was the same myth which was first started by Christian Zionists. We don't really like the Jews. Let's send them somewhere else. Okay. So let's really espouse their cause by saying, you guys should have an, a state of your own because you speak, some of you speak German, some of you speak English, some of you speak French. You should all have one state, one nation, and that nation should be your historical homeland, which is what Israel uh, finally became. So this was the Palestine issue, that there are no Palestinians. This is what Golda Meir said, I think, 1969, that uh, this, there are no Palestinians. So it is theoretically or physically empty. It started by claiming that it was physically empty. Then they discovered there is a large Arab population over there. They said, well, no, the Arab lands are very large. These people can go to other Arab uh, uh, countries, places where uh, Arabic people are there. Why can't they leave this little part of it to us? So they were willing to talk them of Israeli Arabs, but not Palestinians. So the Palestine identity was not available to the Palestinians, though they have, of course, called it the historical Palestine. They identified it as a part at the time of larger uh, Ottoman empires, what would be called the, before the British took it over, what would be called the, the basically Damascus governorate. It's really part of that. But all of that is forgotten. And if you see the founding myth of Israel, that's that land without people uh, and people without land. That's, that's how the Jewish population came to be settled in Israel. And the Arab population was somehow wished away. So this picture of the settler colonial state, which is what embodies the birth of Israel, and you can see why, therefore, over, the, over a period of 30, 40 years, and we can see 48, what the United Nations had said, what finally, uh, you know, if you see, before the United Nations mandate, you can see the hardly some settlements over there. Then you have the next picture which you have where the, what the United Nations mandate was. Large parts of Palestine were actually given to Palestinians, though uh, Israel was given a significant part of it. And then the next 67 war in which Gaza is cut off from West Bank. And of course, they take over the large parts of the they take over the entire West Bank, in fact, and then cut West Bank's areas also significantly. So this progressive growth of uh, the Israeli state 
is also something which is inherent in a settler colonial outlook. Right. Then you have the, even now, large parts of the West Bank are now essentially outposts for further land grabs, which is the settler, large settler population over there, who then will also now claim that we are here, we are half a million, we are not going anywhere. So this whole picture of settler colonialism and the, guy, the ideology of settler colonialism is not something Amnesty really addresses. And what it also doesn't address, which is what has also caused a lot of the unhappiness, is that there have been El Haq, for instance, even in Israel, there is Bethlehem uh, groups which have been peace groups, groups fighting against uh, this kind of apartheid state. All these groups are, men, are basically mentioned but in footnotes. But that acknowledgement of their fight against apartheid Israel is really doesn't find a place. For people like us who have been in the Palestine solidarity movements for a long time across the world, this is a little unusual that that history does, does not somehow find place in Amnesty's right. report. I can understand that for a Western audience, you know, this kind of things are very difficult. I remember I was once in a conference, it's an UN conference on Palestine, and it was interesting that only people who could speak on behalf of the Palestinians were European Jews or North American Jews. Other, other ones who supported Palestine were keeping quiet. So in fact, I remember going and speaking, I said, look, as an Asian, I don't have any problems. We are not a party to what happened to the Jews in Europe and other Christian lands. So we can speak that this is colonial uh, expression that we see what's happening in Israel. And the fact that others are not able to speak about it is because their complicity against uh, anti, you know, uh, against the Jews, against the Jews, anti-Semitic oppression. Particularly, if for a German, it became really much more of a problem to speak in favor of Palestine. I, that's why I was saying amnesty's breaking out of the shell is good, but not acknowledging that all these things were there is one of the weaknesses of the report. Right, and Prabir, since you mentioned anti-Semitism, finally, very quickly, as expected. The response from the Israeli government, its allies all over was to cry anti-Semitism yet again at what is a very factual, well-documented report. So this has, over the years, increasingly become a standard, increasingly become a familiar methodology by which any critic of Israel's policy is being tarred. So how do you see this sort of going about as well? Well, as you've talked about, this Anti-Defamation League has come out with a statement saying this is anti-Semitism. And of course, no explanation that why it should be considered anti-Semitic, what is anti-Semitic in the uh, Amnesty's report, are any of the incidents wrong, are any of the factual evidence wrong, none of that is addressed. It is dismissed saying this is anti-Semitism, period. So essentially when you can't, uh, what shall we say, when you can't confront the arguments or the facts, then you try to shoot the messenger. And that's, that's really what they're trying right. to do, saying this, the amnesty is anti-Semitic. Anybody who says Israel is doing any of these things by definition uh, anti-Semitic. As you know, criticism of the Jewish state, criticism of Israel as a Jewish state, not of Israel per se, but Israel as a Jewish state, is supposed to be anti-Semitic. So if you do not accept that the Jews are the first citizens in Israel, everybody else second class citizen. If you don't accept that, apparently that's anti-Semitic. Semitics, actually Arabs are Semitics as well. But it's not about language. Are you speaking a Semitic language or not? It's about your Jewishness. Only that is, uh, if that is apparently Semitic today. And anybody who does not accept Israel should be a state for the Jews, period. That itself is anti-Semitic. This is what the American Defamation League statement, ADL statement was all about. They, have, they are losing the debate. They're not able to give arguments. What they're giving, therefore, is they, they, basically what would be called name calling. That tar you, calling you anti-Semitic, I don't have to confront your arguments. Right. So the fact is, 
There's a loss of arguments. And they're also too, uh, very worried about what the United Nations reports are going to be. Right. Because if United Nations characterizes, any of the committees characterize Israel as an apartheid state, this is the stamp of the United Nations on it. And reports like Amnesty will really make it much more difficult for Israel to contest this uh, naming that might come about in the human, UN human rights uh, reports and investigations. I think that is what worries Israel and, of course, what worries the Anti-Defamation League, which right. is really, oh, you know what it is all about. Thank you so much, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching NewsClick.